This is Jason at um, Mile High Distilling. I'm here with Zach at Downslope Distilling. Uh, Downslope is in uh, Centennial, which is a suburb of Denver. If you're in the area, come over and check it out. Um, these are the guys that do the classes, the hands-on workshops. Yeah, so like Jason was saying, my name is Zach. Uh, I'm one of the owners here at Downslope Distilling and the fermentation expert and kind of the yeast wrangler and all, all things to do with fermentation. So today, what we're gonna do is we're gonna go through a, a whiskey wash with the, the class. So today the guys wanna learn how to make a, a single malt or a scotch style whiskey. So we're gonna go through the whole uh, step uh, process start to finish with how I would do the mashes and fermentations, yeast and enzymes and everything you kinda need to know. Anytime you're brewing, you're gonna spend a lot of your time cleaning. Um, most of your time's gonna be spent cleaning. So. We're gonna show you guys how to clean uh, and what chemicals we're gonna use and how, how to do it right. So, so basically to start off with, we're gonna use a uh, five star PBW. Um, that's gonna be um, a, a caustic uh, cleaner. So, so basically that is gonna raise the pH of our cleaning solution. So it's basically sodium hydroxide, which is gonna be like our detergent cleaner. So that's gonna get off a lot of those tough solids and anytime you're using chemicals, always use the right dosage rates. Um, PBW is one ounce per gallon of water. So we're basically just filling this up with five gallons of hot water and PBW is hot water, hot rinse. Um, it is not food grade, so we wanna make sure we rinse that really well. And then from that PBW, we're gonna just gonna go back to that star sand, which is gonna be that acid-based cleaner and that's gonna lower the pH. And those huge swings in pH is what's gonna really help uh, disinfect all of our, our brewing equipment. So anything basically our, our wart's gonna touch, we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna clean with both PBW and, and acid or star sand. So basically we're just have, have a two vessel kind of set up over here. So we have, we're using this for our hot liquor tank and then we're gonna use this for our, our mash tun. Um, this is where we're gonna add our grains and do that separation. Um, so basically anything our wort's gonna touch, we're gonna clean with that PBW and that acid. So basically we're running from our mash tun down below, which is where our wort pump is. And from our wort pump, we're going through this counterflow chiller and from the counterflow back in, in, into. So we're basically just gonna cycle this PBW for about 15 to 30 minutes. So we'll go ahead and we'll get this set up. I already have hot water in here. PBW is a, a pretty uh, caustic thing, so we really went ahead and go ahead and wear gloves and, and the eye protection. If you guys kind of saw those tanks over there, you, one thing if you're a brewer or anything, you'll notice we only have two vessels. So if you go into a lot of breweries, you'll see you're always mainly going to see at least three. So we have the hot liquor tank, mash tun, and if you go into a brewery, you're going to see a brew kettle. here. We do not have a brew kettle, which is uh, unique. So what, what we basically do here is make a raw beer. Um, we do it kind of like a, a Norwegian style where it's gonna be raw and we're gonna use a very high mash temperature. And we do this for, for a few reasons. Um, and it's mainly how the enzymes function. There's two enzymes in malted barley, your alpha amylase enzyme and your beta amylase enzyme. They both uh, uh, work on starch molecules and they degrade them into fermentable sugars, but they behave a, a little bit differently. Um, so they kind of work on these bell curves. Um, we'll say this is about 140 degrees Fahrenheit, 150 degrees Fahrenheit, about 160 over here. This is gonna be your beta amylase, and this is gonna be your alpha amylase. So your alpha amylase, about 158-ish degrees, about right here, that's when that's going to be its most active. About 148 degrees right here, this is where your beta amylase is going to be most active. Um, but they both, they both kind of work a little bit differently. So I like to think of a, a starch molecule as just this long chain of C's. These C's will represent glucose. So this is a glucose molecule, and that's all starch is. It's just a bunch of glucose molecules kind of all attached to each other. Um, so your beta amylase, it sees this starch molecule, and it can only grab on on the end. So it can only attach here, and it can only attach here. 
But your start, your beta amylase is very methodical. I like to think of beta amylase kind of like a Pac-Man. So it attaches to this end, and every two is just gonna break. So if this was our starch molecule, we'd be left with these. And that right there is maltose. So two glucose molecules attached to each other is gonna be maltose. Um, so that's gonna be a very fermentable wash. So if you ever see like a brewing thermometer, it will say dry, medium, and then sweet. It says that because this is gonna be very fermentable. Yeast sees that and all that, those maltose, they can just digest instantly. Whereas if your, your alpha amylase, I like to think of alpha as just like comes in and just breaks everything up. It doesn't really care about ends. It just sees a starch molecule and just starts breaking it. So you might get it, break it here, you might break it here. So what you'll notice is you might get left with something that looks like that, but then you might also get something that looks like this. So this is gonna be your maltodextrins or your dextrin molecules, those longer chain sugar molecules. But again, you're left with maltose, maltose, and then like a glucose, let's say. Um, so you are gonna make some alcohol. This is gonna be a fermentable sugar and that yeast sees that and is gonna be able to eat it. But it, it sees this molecule and is like, what is that? I can't eat that. So it just kind of skips that. And then you're left with these sugar or these dextrin molecules in your wash. So when you would taste it, it would taste sweet. So that's why those growing thermometers will say dry, medium, sweet. This is gonna be very fermentable and this is gonna be kind of left in the middle. You might be left with some of these, but you're mostly gonna get a fermentable wash. So when are we looking at the data in the alphas? So are we testing for those or do we know what they are ahead of time depending on the mass? No, you just know your temperature ranges where they're gonna be the most active and you're gonna exploit them based on those temperature ranges. And we're looking at those temperature ranges when? When we are distilling or when we are? When you're doing that starch conversion. So basically we're gonna add that grain and then we're gonna have your strike water. So we're gonna add that grain to a, a predetermined volume and temperature of water and that's gonna end us up where we want in our temperature zone. So what's the difference of process in making this mash that we made a sugar mash yesterday? What's the main difference? The main difference is y yesterday you just had glucose. You just had this. Right. You didn't have this long chain of starch. Right. So this is starch, and we need to basically break down that starch into a fermentable sugar. Whereas right. yesterday, or right. when you're making wine, that is all already fermentable. So you didn't have to break down that starch. So basically, we're gonna, we're gonna do that match. So we're gonna add the starch to that right temperature and we're gonna basically let it sit there and let those enzymes just attack these starch molecules. So an enzyme is just a protein with a function. So it's just a protein that, that does, does something. So in this case, it takes starch and breaks it down. And, it, and an enzyme, it just does a chemical reaction that's already gonna happen anyway. It just kind of speeds up a chemical reaction. So it's about a 90, 60 to 90 minute mash. We're gonna make uh, like a single malt or like kind of like a scotch today. So we could probably get away with like a 60 minute mash because that's all malted barley. So it's 100% malted barley. All those grains have enzymes in there. Whereas if we were doing like a, a rye whiskey or like a bourbon, we'd probably want like a 90 or at least 90 minute mash because there's no enzymes in that corn or that flaked rye that we'd be using. All right, so when you say mash, what's the definition of a mash? So mash is going to when we're going to add that grain and hot water together. Okay. No sugar yet. Just no grain. sugar at all. We're not going to no use yeast. any sugar. No yeast yet. No yeast. No yeast. Nutrient. No yeast nutrient yet. All we're doing is adding mash, bread, and uh, hot water to grains. We're breaking down the starch. And side. we're just breaking down that starch. Yep. Exactly. Um, so this is kind of what we're going for here so what we like to do is we start hot we start about here and then we just kind of let it cool so there's multiple ways to match there's multiple ways to do this um, some people go the other way we like to go backwards um, it just saves saves time and, and all of our equipment is all passive system so we just make sure we hit that strike water at the right temperature to, to hit here and then we kind of let it cool there's multiple reasons we, we do this so like I was saying before, this is what that alpha amylase does. So it's gonna take that big long starch molecule and it's gonna kind of break it up. And then that alpha, 
you know, so we started a little bit hot and then we kind of, we're gonna let it drop to here. So we're gonna hit both these enzyme zones. And once we get here, that beta amylase is gonna be more active and it's gonna have this to work with then. So what you notice is there's gonna be a lot more ends here. Are we gonna introduce any enzymes, anything outside of the grains into, into these pots? So if we were gonna do um, something with like very low dias, what you'd call diastatic power, which is basically how much power of that enzyme to do that conversion on that starch. If our, if our DP or our diastatic power number was like below 50 or really low, we'd wanna add additional en enzymes somehow. So what we do here is we use artificial enzymes, AMLO 300 and, and beta glucanase, especially if there's gonna be a lot of proteins in there. And those are gonna work more at a mash temperature and those will help break down our proteins. So what other people will do is because between like down at this end, between 113 to like 130 degrees Fahrenheit, those protein molecules or, or enzymes are going to be more active. So some people will do a protein rest for an hour and basically try to break down all those beta glucans and all those proteins. They'll heat it up. They'll do a, a beta rest for an hour. They'll sit at like 148. They'll raise it up to about 155 and they'll sit there for an hour. So that's going to be like a three hour long mash period. Whereas what we do, if we start hot, we start about 158, and we go backwards. And from here, we add protein enzyme to, to that that works at a mash temperature, and we do everything at once. We break down the proteins, we Are break down starch. Are you protein enzyme just by adding the water? You're not adding anything else, though, like you said. So you're adding, are you gonna, you're gonna heat the water twice? You're gonna do this two times? You're gonna do it uh, 158, bring it down to 140, and then you're gonna do it again 160? Nope, nope, so we're gonna start with our straight water, a set volume of water at a certain temperature, and then we're gonna, with the temperature of our grains and the volume of our grains, we're gonna basically use math to hit this number and just let it cool. Okay. Over that 90 minutes mash, or 60 minutes, whatever. What about the alpha? So that's what we're gonna hit first. We're gonna, we're gonna try to hit right here first. So about 155 to 158 is what we're shooting for. And that's gonna be that alpha. That's gonna be that alpha zone. The and spot. then we're gonna let it cool. Yeah. And then it's gonna go through here. So a lot of people like to mash like 150, 152, because both those enzymes are very active at, gotcha. that, at that range. But then once you get below 150-ish, that beta amylase is gonna pick up again. So we wanna hit both those enzymes. <coughs> because we, we're making alcohol, we're making whiskey. We want a very fermentable wash. We don't want like all these sugar molecules left behind because that's just booze that we didn't convert. So that's just sugar we left in there. And, and we don't want that. We want it all to kind of be like this. You know, we want just maltose. We want a very fermentable wash. Cause we'd like, if you're making like a beer or something, you might want to leave some of that sugar molecule behind because it's going to add body to your beer. Whereas we're not going to be drinking the wash. We want to distill all that in, into alcohol. So we just want a very, we just want maltose. And you can see here, this is a, a sugar wash or a grain wash for us. You know, we, we did it in, in four days, and we went from 1073 to basically zeros in four days. Um, so what this does too, is this hot mash kind of helps disinfect our wash a little bit. Um, so sitting at, you know, 100 and almost 60 degrees for 90 minutes is gonna help disinfect some of that grain because we're not gonna be boiling this grain. So a lot of people would boil it to kind of disinfect that wash. But what we do is, we have a very active yeast, so it's a very short lag time. So we just make sure all of our equipment's super clean, our mash tons, our fermenters, all of our lines. And then we have this very high mash temperature, which, which helps disinfect it. And then we have a yeast with a very short lag time. So we, this yeast is, is kind of like a kvike yeast that the Norwegians kind of do, um, where it just cranks in like a few days. So we went through 1073 to zeros very fast. We can see here in one day, it went from 1073 to 1030, and then from 1030 to 1009. Mm -hmm. So basically in two days, it, it went through all, the, all those molecules in there. So all of that stuff, now it's a very harsh environment because that's you know eight and a half percent alcohol by volume in two days. So it's less likely to get infected by any bacteria or yeast or fungus after it has, is at eight, nine percent. And so it, it just scavenges all those nutrients so fast that nothing can really compete with that yeast. We make sure that that, that cell count's really high and we make sure it, it just has such a head start that nothing can compete with it.
So that's what we do. So instead of boiling, we don't need to disinfect that wash. We just mash hot. We have a very active yeast with a very short leg time that will just plow through those nutrients very fast. And then we just get it right into the still. So after you know four days, that was in the still and we distilled it into alcohol. And once we have all that alcohol, it's at basically no risk for being infected after it's at 79 proof. So then, you know, micro microbial activity basically halts and you don't have to worry about it. Um, so you'll, you'll see here, our, our, this is our original gravity, this is temperature, and that's bricks. But what you'll notice is this increase in temperature. So we, we started at 73 degrees Fahrenheit and it got to 90 degrees. And that's basically all that, all the yeast is creating all that energy. And that's just heat energy coming off the yeast. So that, that raised that tank 17 degrees, which is pretty incredible. Um, and these are all passive systems, so we start a little lower, and we know that we're at least gonna raise 10 to 12 degrees every time. So we start a little lower, because this yeast likes it hot. It likes it in that 85 to 90 degrees. So we start 75 knowing that that tank's gonna rise to 85. And it's just gonna kinda hang out there then. At the bottom down there, you say that proof, that was 79 proof coming out of it? Yeah, and that's, that's a happened. stripping run. So that's a stripping, stripping run. Comes out of yep. So we got it into our big double diamond still. We yep. did that stripping run, and we got about uh, 37 gallons at 80 proof. Like that. Um, so and that's that's what we want to see, too. And then you got that, 37 gallons at 80 proof, so you don't have that's you don't have to proof that then. That's at 80. Proof. Well, it has to be redistilled into a spirit. Oh, okay. That's the stripping. Run. That's a stripping. Run. And that's going to raise that proof and increase our volume down yeah. again. Um, and then what you're going to notice here, besides temperature, so make sure your temperature range is, for, is in that range for the yeast, but also original gravity and uh, pH are going to be super important. So all we do here is we, we filter our city water. We, we're in Denver, Colorado, so our, our water is, is fairly soft here. So all we do is filter that water going into our mash tun, and then we add fast, uh, uh, food grade phosphoric acid to lower the pH of that water. Um, so yeah, you don't need, you don't need much. We like I like using the phosphoric acid because uh, it's more concentrated than the vinegar is. It's like a, a 75 percent acidic solution compared to like a maybe three to four percent. It's not acidic acid. It's a different kind. It's phosphoric. Phosphoric. Yep. Yeah. Um, so it's very concentrated, so you just need a little bit of it and it goes a long way. So we want to mash about 5.2 pH is, is ideal for, our, for both um, enzyme activity inside our mash tun, but also for the yeast inside that fermentation vessel. It's going to like a slightly acidic environment. Um, so we're just going to add just a little phosphoric acid to lower that the pH. the definition of the word mash tun? Mash tun is just the vessel that we're going to use to separate our grain from our water. So. We like to separate all of our stuff here. So mash tun is a, a definition of a fermenter? No, the definition of a fermenter is uh, just where the, the fermentation happens. There's going to be no fermentation inside our mash tun. We're just basically adding grain and water, and then we're going to separate that water from that grain after we've done that conversion on all that sugar. Okay. And then we're going to use that conversion, and then we're going to sparge, and that hot water, we're just going to push out all that sweet wort from that mash. Into that, into that, and then you're going to take that and put it into the still. We're going to take it and go, that's going to go into the fermenter, okay. and then we're going to ferment that for about a few days. So about three, four days, we're going to take all that sugar uh, that we just broke down, and we're going to add yeast, and the yeast is going to take that sugar and eat it and digest it and turn it into alcohol. So your and mash tun is just basically what it is, it's just your... Like where you mash, where you, yeah. where you, where you break, like where, like a crush, like a, when we make wine, it's our, it's, you, you crush yeah. into our barrels, or what we crush into. Yep, exactly. So it's your breakdown process. Yep. Okay. Exactly. So yep, we're gonna break down uh, just that starch there, and then after that uh, grain, we get all that sugar out of that grain. The grain is spent grain, then that will just go off to the farmer or wherever you're gonna get rid of it. Um, so we like to separate all of our grain here. Um, there's other distilleries that will uh, ferment on the grain and like even distill on the grain. Uh, we, we like separating for a couple of reasons. We, we think you get a little bit more delicate of a spirit. Um, it, we get just a really clean wash. So basically, when we break down all those proteins in our mash, um, it's gonna make that wash super clear. So 
going into that still, we're gonna have a very clear wash that has very little proteins in it. If you have, if you're fermenting uh, inside your still and on the grains, you're gonna have a ton of protein in there. So it's very easy to scorch that alcohol. It's very easy to burn those proteins and it's very easy to get a burnt alcohol flavor. So you have to avoid that. So we separate it all out. Agitators inside some tanks or not? So don't bring it in. So you're gonna have to separate that out or clean it out at some point and it's, it's just a nightmare to clean when it's all inside of it. And it's just easier to just separate it out at the beginning and the yeast actually it's, it, it behaves better when it's just a clear solution of, of wort. It's a little bit harder for it to dig through all that grain to get, get to everything. What do you do with the waste? Uh, we send it to a farmer. Okay. So all that spent grain goes to a, a local farmer here in Colorado. Um, so original gravity is going to be super important. You're not going to want to go much higher than this. So if you start you know, going 1080, 1090, and you have like this really strong wash, you wanna make you know, a 15, 20% alcohol by volume solution, depending on the yeast, but that adds a lot of stress to it. So that's gonna be your osmotic pressure or tolerance on that yeast. So I kind of like to think of osmotic tolerance as, it's basically just sugar on the outside of that yeast. So how I like to think of it is like if you ever like dump sugar on like a soft fruit, like a strawberry or something like that, it's gonna expel that moisture into the outside environment. You can just see it, it just goes right into the sugar. Um, same thing happens on that yeast. So you can imagine that little yeast cell that's swimming inside that tank is just that piece of fruit and that's just sugar you dumped on top of it. It's just in sugar in solution, but basically that's gonna wanna pull that moisture outside of that yeast cell. So to maintain osmotic balance, that yeast cell is gonna have to work harder to not, not basically explode because it's gonna try to suck all that moisture out of it and you're gonna stress it out. If you have a, a really high original gravity, I'm gonna make a 18% sugar wash and you just dumped a bunch of sugar inside that yeast, that yeast is just gonna be stressed out. So anytime you stress out your yeast basically, it's gonna make different compounds than what you want. So it's gonna make butanol, it's gonna make propanol, it's gonna make all these other longer chain alcohol molecules and we're making we want ethanol. We don't want anything else but a clean ethanol product. So when you start stressing out that yeast with really high temperatures or really high original gravities, um, or like your pH is out of whack, that's gonna stress it out and it's gonna make funky compounds. So keep your yeast as happy as you can in that tank. Watch your original gravities, watch your temperatures, watch your pH. Those are the most important things. And then if you hit this starch conversion, right, you're gonna have good, good stuff. Because um, you put garbage in, you put something that makes a ton of butanol, propanol in your fermentation, into your still, you're going to get a lot of tails. So all that stuff is going to taste harsh and it's not going to taste good. So you put good stuff in, good clean ethanol fermentation into your still, you're going to get a good clean ethanol product out of it. So you put garbage in, you get garbage out. And it's, I mean, you can try cleaning it up with, you know, distilling it to nothing, but it's a lot easier to make good spirits from, from a good starting product. So now we'll just kind of go through uh, the variables and kind of design our, our recipe. And that's your final gravity. Mm. So it's going to be 0 0.071 divided by 0.776 times 100. And that's just a constant. So it takes 0 0.071 divided by 0 0.776 times 100. Mm -hmm. 9 so that's about 9%. So it's a fairly strong, I mean, that's a respectable starting charge. So that's the charge going in. You can see we got about that. Now. And our chart from yesterday is right about where so we wanted to be. Um, so now, like, Designing a recipe is all just a math problem. It's how much volume of water at what temperature do we need to add our grains at what volume of grains to get to that temperature enzyme zone that we want. So we want to hit 155 to 158. We, we know the, the starting temperature that we want. So now we just have to kind of work backwards. So what is they all different for all the different grains that you use? Is rye different than wheat different than? Um, just kind of depends. 
it's more about your mash thickness at that point. It's because I like a little bit thinner mash on, on like a, a rye or like a bourbon when we make those. And it's just all kind of like preference at that point too. And it's kind of more equipment variables and that's just like getting into the real nitty gritty stuff. But we'll kind of go a little bit more broad just to kind of start. So, uh, so it's just batch variables. So it's all variables no matter what you do. It's just what what do we need to do? So what's the most important variable? Is well, how much are we making first of all? So if we're making, are we making 300 gallons? Are we making seven and a half like we're making today? So batch size. Uh, so we're gonna aim for about seven and a half gallons. We know that. Okay. So we need to know, we're basically going to use the Brewer's Friend calculator or you can use like Beersmith or anything that will basically, you'll enter what grain you're using and, and at what OG. So we know, we want to OG of about like 10.55 to about you know, like 10.65. We want to be like kind of in this range and this will kind of give us that like 8% by alcohol volume. We really got a really good conversion on this one. Um, so that's why that one is just a little bit high, but we like to aim for about this, about 1065, 1055, 1065. It's a good, good range. And that's gonna give you um, a decent amount of alcohol, and it's not gonna stress your yeast out because that is an os like a pretty uh, low osmotic tolerance for like the yeast that we're using. So, so on a 1055 to 1065, if it ferments all the way out, what will you end up with as far as percentage goes uh, in alcohol by volume? Yep, so we can kind of do the math on this one right here. So this is um, an agave, uh, agave spirit that we made. So we started at 1.065. So that's our original gravity, 0.65. And then we subtract our final, which we got all the way down to zero here. So just flat, nothing. So that's, you know, 0.065. And then we'll divide that by 0.776 times 100. And that will give us our alcohol by volume. It's about 8.3%. And that's still a pretty safe amount of alcohol. You don't get too many off compounds. No, nope, exactly. So that's going to be a fairly strong starting charge, about eight, almost eight and a half percent. But it's still going to be not going to make all that uh, harsh alcohols, all those butanols and propanols and everything else. So you start stressing out that yeast with that really high original gravity. Um, it's going to you're going to start making some often some funky compounds. And we don't want those. So we like to live in kind of in this range. 7 to 9%. You start pumping it, you know, 12, 15, 20% alcohol, it's not going to make it, not going to be nearly as good. So 7 to 10%, that's the... That's, that's the kind of the range we, we like to live in, yeah, yep. Um, so we're just going to use Brewer's Friend to kind of determine our, our pound of grains. And then we just need to know the... and the temperature. So how do we find these? And then we need to know sparge. So sparge is gonna be super important too. Um, that's gonna be at the end. So basically we're gonna do that mash, we're gonna add that grain, and then once we sparge, it's just basically a hot rinse on that grain bed. And that's gonna help push out all that first wort and, and just kind of get all that sugar off that grain. And this is basically always use 170 degree water. It's about ideal for sparge water. So that won't ever change, but your, your volume, uh, it will. So how are we gonna find these numbers? We're just gonna use a computer. So there's a lot of good programs on the internet that you can just search, and they'll figure out all these numbers for us. Um, and we kind of know these guys came in, they wanna make like a Scotch style single malt. So we're basically gonna do a 25% peated uh, with a 75% multiplier. Uh, regular two row multiplier. Um, so we kind of already have kind of idea of what we want to make. We kind of know how big our batch is and kind of know the original gravity of our wash. 
So now we'll just kind of we'll go to the computer and we'll use resources on the internet to design that. So if you just search Brewer's Friend on, on Google, it'll be the first one that pops up. And then for the sparge and volume calculator, I like to use this um, My Brew Supply. Um, so we'll start on Brewer's Friend. And you just go to Beer Recipe Builder. And this is a free program on the internet. It's mainly made for like home brewers. Uh, but it will work well for what we're doing here. So basically, we just kind of have to enter our variables now. So batch size, you want seven and a half gallons, and that's our target into the fermenter. It's gonna ask for boil time. We're gonna say zero minutes, we're not gonna boil this. Uh, efficiency, and that's basically your equipment variables. Um, we have a lot of hoses here, so we usually get only about 70% on the small scale. Whereas you saw on the big scale, we got 94. Um, and that, that's mainly to do with size. So basically anytime you're brewing, you're gonna lose a gallon or two in the bottom of your mash tun, in your lines, in there. And two gallons compared to seven and a half is the almost 20, like 25%. Whereas two gallons compared to 300 is a lot smaller. So as you get bigger in scale, your efficiency just gets better. And so if you're hitting like around 70 or you know 65 to like 75% efficiency is kind of what I would assume for like the first time kind of home brewing. So larger equipment actually has less loss. Yeah. And being, this is being home brewing equipment, that's where you're figuring about the 70%? Yeah, exactly. So on the smaller scale, um, you'll lose that. But if you're getting like 50% efficiency, you might be like, oh man, I got a problem. But if you're getting it in like the 70 to 80 or like 60 to 65 to 75 range, I, I wouldn't worry about it too much. Okay. So now we can just kind of search our fermentables. So we're, we're aiming for about 25% peated and 75% uh, just regular two row malted barley. Um, and then we can just kind of search the grains that we're using here too. Uh, so we'll just start with about four and, th and this will calculate all the math for us. And then we will use this, the Glen Eagles peated malt. So you can just kind of search whatever mall you're using and just kind of hit click add. And then the other one, we're just going to use a two row malted barley. So we're just going to find the two row that we're using. And this has, is going to have most grains that you'll find in like your typical brew store. So we need a little bit more here. So that, that ends up about perfect. Um, so we started, we'll start with about 12 pounds of two row, and we'll go about four pounds of uh, peated malt, and that's gonna be a total of 16 pounds. Um, and this says about five and a half percent, um, but that's gonna be because that's gonna be calculated for a brewer's yeast, which is not gonna be nearly uh, as attenuative as a, a distiller's yeast, which is what we're gonna recommend. So if you go down a little cheat, is you can just search Saison. Saison has what's called diastaticus in it, and diastaticus can basically break down, uh, it releases an alpha amylase enzyme in, in solution in the fermenter. So it can break down any of those uh, remaining like starch molecules. So you can see here that dropped it to 1006 and when we're at 1014, and that gets us about six and a half percent. And this will go even further than that. We'll probably get to about zero with the yeast that we're gonna be using. Uh, so that'll be closer to seven by the time we're really done. Okay, so now we know kind of the goal. We should get about a 1055 wash at, with this about 16 pounds. So now we'll go to this My Brew Supply water calculator. And then we'll just enter all the variables that we just talked about. So our batch size, we're aiming for about seven and a half gallons. Our grain bill in pounds is 16 pounds. Our original gravity will be 1055. Our boil length will be zero. And then mash thickness. So this is gonna be like how thick do you want your mash? And about 1.25 is uh, fairly decent. I like a little bit thinner. Uh, so we'll go to about one and a half. And this is kind of more preference and just experience. And how do you come up with even a starting point if you've never done this before? Start at 1.25 and then if it's too thick, add a little bit more water to it. 
And then it's just a sweet spot. You want it, you don't want it to be too thin. You don't want it to be too thick. And that's mainly for enzymes. They, they're gonna like it in that kind of sweet spot. If it's too thin, they won't be as effective. If it's too thick, it won't be as effective. Gotcha. It's kind of, you gotta kind of find that Goldilocks zone. Okay. Um, that's gonna ask for max That's profile. gonna be more by eye and by feel and preference. And it just, just doing it. Um, so you're gonna have to take notes while you're doing it too, especially just take a lot of notes while you're doing it and just say, I have this volume of water, I have this pound of grains, especially if you're gonna be your, like a recipe you're gonna bring into like a production setting. Um, this is gonna ask for mash profile now. So we're gonna aim for about a full body. And that that's kind of, it's saying full body because it's this is mainly made for beer people. So it says full body because they're expecting you to mash at 156 for that whole time. And that's when you'd only get that alpha amylase conversion. So if you did that for a beer, and if you drank it, you'd be left with those dextrin molecules and that's gonna add body to your beer. So it's gonna say full body because it's gonna assume that you're gonna be leaving molecules behind, but how we're gonna do it, we're not worried about that and that's not gonna happen. But that they're saying like light, light body, medium body. And our, ours will actually end out being light, just be how we're gonna mash. But, so, but that's the temperature we want to aim for, is one, about 156. So 155 to 158 is what we're trying to go for. Um, and this is equipment variables now. And this is kind of just all, it's gonna change. No matter, your equipment's gonna be different than what we're using here. Um, so it's gonna kind of be how you have it set up. So just, you're gonna have to do it, and then kind of calculate your own variables. Um, so we're not going to boil, so we can adjust this one to zero, but we lose at least a gallon in our mash tun every time, and we, we're going to lose about that. So I always calculate for about losing two gallons of water. So then you just tick calculate, and this will tell you your total water needed, the strike volume, sparge volume, and the temperature of that strike water. So this is what we're going to go for. So we're going to need about six gallons inside our mash tun at 165 degrees Fahrenheit uh, to get to 156 degrees. So once we add that grain, it's gonna lose temperature because that grain is gonna absorb some of that heat energy and that's gonna give us our, our target mash. So basically we're gonna add six volumes into our mash tun, we'll add our 16 pounds of grain, we'll let that uh, kind of mixed together. We'll hopefully end up at that 155 zone and then at that 155 We'll let it sit there for that 60 to 90 minutes and let it cool go through that alpha amylase rest through that beta amylase rest and then into the fermenter and then we'll ferment it out We are ferment about four days five days. Yep, and then it's just gonna be a few days So that's gonna be kind of our goal here So now we'll just kind of weigh out our grains and then we'll finish cleaning So malted barley has all three. You can see this has already been crushed. So I've already milled this. Um, so this stuff won't come milled, but it's, uh, we've already milled it for us. But you can kind of look at it and you can see all that husk there. And then that kind of the white stuff in there, that's gonna be your starch. And then there's enzymes in here as well. So you need all three basically if you wanna do a complete brew. So this is gonna be our, our flaked rye. Flaked rye has no husk and there's no enzyme. It's basically just starch and protein. So rye has a ton of protein in it. So anytime you're doing like a, a rye brew, you have to break down those proteins. And those are gonna be your, your beta-glucan molecules. So you have to do that protein rest, basically if you're gonna be a, using a high rye, any type of high rye brew. Um, and then you're also going to need to add some sort of husk and enzyme to this as well. So you're going to need to use at least some percentage of malted barley and to do that conversion. So this is basically just husk. Mm -hmm. So we'll add husk back to rye brews and over here we have a flake corn. Flake corn is basically just starch. There's really not much to this flake corn besides starch, whereas like this has so much more protein in it. It's a lot easier to gunk up and get a stuck mash doing rye brews compared to a, a, with corn. this, with the corn. The corn's very easily, uh, will dissolve into solution. It's very easy to break down. So today we don't need to worry about it because we have 100% malted barley. Malted barley is great, so no worries there. So we'll just go ahead and we'll weigh this out. This is gonna be our peated malt here. So we need four pounds of this, and then we're gonna need 12 pounds. This is gonna be our two row malted barley. So 
This has been circulating for about 30 minutes now and we've kind of sprayed everything down with it and so everything should be nice and clean. So we can go ahead and, and get rid of this now. So how do you get rid of PVW? Basically run water the same time you're running it down the drain. You can see we have two stills running right now. We're running this uh, 16 gallon mile high still and we're running a, 15, a 50 gallon mile high still. And we're pushing all that condenser water to straight down our drain here. So we can just go ahead and dump this PVW because we're rinsing water. So we'll go ahead and we'll just shut off our, our war pump. And we'll just kind of dump it now. And then we'll just go ahead and we'll go our cleaner into this fermenter. So we'll make sure everything's nice and clean. One more time, just give it a nice little rub down. You're not going to want to use like a, uh, anything that's like harder than like a foam brush like this. You're not going to want to use like steel wool. You'll scratch your equipment and that's just going to give a place for microbes to hide. So don't do that. It's like a nice uh, fun uh, brush works, works perfect. So just everything we're going to touch, our paddle, our, our false bottom, all that, all that stuff. And we want to make sure we get it all the cleaner out, all of it through the lines as well. So we want to make sure it's all gone. So how are we going to do that? We're going to basically fill this up with hot water and we're going to keep pumping that hot water just through our lines and once we know all that cleaner is out, then we'll go back in. Because this is not a food grade cleaner, we want to make sure we're not in injustice in any way. So always use water to push your lines through too. Because you're not going to want to mix chemicals. So it's like we're not going to want to make sure anything mixes. Okay. So on this small scale, it's like we just kind of dump the rest. So again, this is just a two vessel system since we're making a raw beer. So just our hot liquor tank and our water pump. So now we have like about 150 degree water there. We're going to use this hot water and circulate this hot water again the same way we just did that PBW. Just clean, clean hot water. Just clean, clean hot water. So again, just spray everything down real well with your hot water, your bag, your false bottom. Put your water in for one second. Uh, it's about 150 degrees, so you're going to want to run PBW about 130 to 160 degrees Fahrenheit, same with your hot water. And obviously the hotter the water, the better. So if you get 175 degree water or 180 degree water, that's perfectly fine. And then kind of for our setup, how we're doing it is we're just using this mile high controller and basically uh, the bottom of uh, the still almost. This is the same part. We're heating up our water here um, with an electrical heating element and it's just kind of all on that controller. Okay. So now we have just hot water inside of our, our mash tun. Want to make sure we go ahead and we'll get that air bubble out and get it nice and primed in our pump and just kind of let that caustic continue to flow through. So once you get that air bubble out, we'll go ahead and turn our water pump on and get the rest of that caustic out of our chiller and out of our lines. And just kind of watch it. Once you're pretty sure you're confident all that caustic is through, go ahead and just kind of go back in. Then we'll turn our war pump back on. So now this is just basically a rinse. So we'll let this run a few minutes, but we don't need to do it for like 30 minutes how we did that first one. We'll let it run for a couple minutes. 
and then we'll go ahead uh, and finish cleaning our mash tun or our fermenter. By the time we get that clean, we'll get this hot water in there, rinse that real good, and then we'll be ready to run Star Sand. Star Sand we can do a little bit faster too. Star Sand's a one-minute contact sanitizer, so basically just get cold water. Uh, add our star sand, just loop that for a few minutes. Once we're confident that everything's nice and clean, we'll go ahead and just pump that into our fermenter. And then we'll let that star sand just kind of hang out. And we'll keep that sanitizer around. So anything else we want to sanitize in the future, uh, maybe like our air bongs or um, any equipment we're going to be touching, uh, our thermometers or whatever, uh, we'll just keep that bucket around so we can sanitize anything as we need. Basically, we're, we're ready to start our mash now. So, uh, we just need to get our water from our hot liquor tank into our mash tun you know, at, at the right temperature and the right volume. So, we got that number from my, my brew supply. And so, right now, we have about 175 degree water in our hot liquor tank. And when we transfer our water from our hot liquor tank to our mash tun, we know we're going to lose about 10 degrees, 10 to 12 degrees every time. So, 175. To about 165 and that's what we're aiming for we got that number for my brew supply our strike volume and strike temperature so now we can go ahead and we'll turn on our water pump and we'll get our hot water in so we need about six gallons of strike water and this mash tun is graduated on the back we'll just kind of watch it all on the back And we're just going to wait once this water gets over this false bottom when we, when we know what we'll, then we'll add our grains and we'll mix it up. And then this is just filtered water. So uh, coming in from the city, we just filtered this water and we haven't done anything to it. Um, on the bigger batches, we will add phosphoric acid, but on this, it's such a small amount. That stuff is so concentrated. And our water's uh, about seven and seven and a half pH. Not really worried about the pH too much. So, and that's mainly because I don't want to overdo that acid. And it's very easy. We'd only need about a milliliter or two for like six gallons. And it's really easy to overdo it. So here, we'll just kind of let it go. We'll just use our, our normal city water. But on the bigger ones, once it gets to about 50 milliliters when we're doing a couple hundred gallons of water, it's a lot easier to dial in your pH. Because this, it's a bit, it'd be about two milliliters, one to two milliliters, and that is such a small volume, it's, it can, it's easy to overdo it. So when we do the big scale stuff, a little acid goes a long way. So this you just need a little bit, and that just lowers our pH a little bit. Um, but on this scale and on this size, if you did this, if, depending on your starting water, if your pH is like nine coming in from your city, you might want to think about adding a little bit of acid to it. But since our water is, is fairly neutral here, it's not too good. Okay, so we got about six gallons in here right now. Our strike water is about 168 degrees. So I'll just kind of splash it around. It's a little bit warmer than we wanted. And then those, those proteins will denature at 170. So as long as we don't get this mash over 170 degrees, those proteins will not denature, they will be in solution. So we're, go, we're good to go ahead and add some barley. So let's go ahead and we'll get this grain going. And it's nice and slow going in. Just keeps it from bunching up. Yeah, and then I'll we'll just kind of give it a little stir. How much water do you have in there now? We got six gallons of water. And you'll put all the grain in the six, you know, 16 pounds of grain in the six gallons of water? Yep. Let's keep going. And then we're not going to want to agitate this too much. We just want to make sure all the grain is saturated with this water. And there's no just like clumps. We don't want to beat, beat, that, beat it because that's going to extract a lot of those proteins that we want to kind of keep inside of the side of it. Yep, so we'll go ahead and add that one. And just dump it all right in. So this false bottom sits up a little high in, the, in this small uh, batch. So just based on this mash thickness, 
it looks like we're going to need to add a little bit more strike water. Um, and what we'll do with that is we'll just subtract this from our sparge water at the end. So we'll just go ahead and we'll add a little bit more hot water. About 175 degrees over there. We know we're going to lose about 10 degrees. So there's a false bottom in here and then there's a the bag in, inside the kettle. Yep. Okay. So you go, ahead, you go ahead and look at this mash now. That looks like a good mash thickness. So you can kind of go ahead and feel it and just kind of get a feel for it. So it's not too thin, it's not too thick. It's kind of that Goldilocks. That's ideal. Yep. It's about perfect. So since we add a little bit more volume of water, our temperature is a little hot. We're about 160 degrees. So we are a few degrees warm. So what I'll go ahead and do is just leave this open. This will help it lose temperature a little faster. And once we kind of get in that 155, 158 zone, I'll go ahead and cover it up and then we'll wrap it with like a jacket. So basically right now, all that's all those enzymes we're talking about on the board, that's what's happening inside this tank. So all that starch is getting broken down by the enzymes in this malted barley. So now, basically, we just have to let this sit for about an hour, and all that starch will get broken down into a fermentable sugar. All I'll do during that 60 minutes is just give this a couple stirs. So about 15 minutes, give it a little stir. About 15 minutes, give it another little stir. And then after that, let it sit. You're not gonna wanna stir it right before our runoff because you're just gonna kick up all those proteins again that just all settled out. Um, only reason we're mixing is just for efficiencies. Another thing we can do is we're gonna try and we're gonna loop it back through and just to make sure we have a nice even temperature in, inside our mesh bed. So that's all I'll do is just basically don't mess with it. Give it a couple stirs every now and then and just kind of make sure your temperatures are right. But it's looking good. So now we just kind of let it do its thing. So now is a good time uh, to ask questions. If you have any questions on this, we're we talking about looping it back through. You can take the moisture, the water back out, the mash water out. Yeah. So exactly how we were cleaning, we're just yeah. going to suck that mash out of the bottom and put it right back on top. So that's called floor lofting. So that's going to do a, a, a few things. It's an old German term. Okay. So basically, all those grain particles that are gonna come through at first, all the smaller grain, we're gonna push that back on top of that mash bed, and we're gonna use that mash bed to filter out all those grain particles. So by the time we run off, our, our wash will be super clear, and that's because we've used that grain bed to filter our wash. So now, basically, uh, we'll let this sit, and let's kinda keep an eye on it, give it a couple stirs. Now we just kind of went through that starch conversion. So it's been about an hour and we went ahead and we broke for lunch. So we started, it was about 158, 160 degrees when we started that mash. You can look now, we're at about 148 degrees. So we, we dropped that 10 degrees. Like I was saying, we hit both those enzyme conversion zones. We hit that alpha first. We dropped a little temperature. Now we're sitting like right in that beta amylase zone. So, I'm pretty confident we got a really good conversion here. It's been over an hour. So let's go ahead and we'll, we'll start our runoff now. So what we're basically gonna do is we're gonna bore off. So we're just gonna pump everything back on top right now. So we just need to drain uh, some of this water out of this line. And then once we start seeing more flow, we'll go ahead and we'll dump it back up. So let's just go ahead and open that ball valve. Kind of bring this down a little bit. We've got to try this pump. Yeah, I was going to ask that question when I saw that contraption. Mm -hmm. I was going to ask if you needed to find that. So you're draining the water out of it. Yeah, so we're just drawing, drawing all the water out of the line now. All the water out of the line. Yep, yeah, so now you can see some, some, some now. wash coming now. Just make sure it's not watered down. We'll just kind of make sure it's all, all nice and front of it. Okay. 
Okay, so now I see wash coming through. Let's go ahead and we'll pump this back over here. I'm just going to choke it just a little bit. <laughs> so, this is what you'd call war lofting. So, we're basically, we're taking all that first wart out and we're pumping it back on top. And any of uh, smaller green particles, we're just going to filter that right back through this mash bed. And we'll let this run for about five to ten minutes. And so what this is doing, this is helping filter uh, our wash. And what we're going to do now, we're going to go ahead and we're going to add our yeast nutrient to this. Um, we're always going to do this while it's hot. It's just going to dissolve better in hot water. So we don't need much, you just need about a tablespoon of nutrient. So we're just going to use about a tablespoon of yeast nutrient. And it's right in the mesh. Then we're just going to use this hot wash to do, make sure all that gets nice and dissolved. Did you have to do any kind of use the brew, um, the brew uh, what uh, tool to find out how much yeast or nutrient you needed for the batch, like we did yesterday with the sugar? Um, so they all have dosage rates uh, on the bottom. So yeah, you only need about a tablespoon for about per five gallons. Um, like with sugar washes though, you're going to remember that you're going to need a lot more nutrients. Um, so that's basically what you call FAN or free amino nitrogen. That's really what you need to, for the yeast. So that yeast is going to want that nitrogen for basically cellular functions and it's going to use that to basically reproduce and to grow. So we just want to make sure that we have enough nitrogen, but again, these grains that we're using, they're, they're going to naturally contain some nitrogen, whereas when we did those sugar washes yesterday, we had to add a lot more nutrient because none, there's no nitrogen in any of that. So you need a lot more nutrient when we're doing the sugar and the agave washes compared to when we're doing these grains. That's why I asked, because it's like a tablespoon. Yeah, so... Hardly anything compared yeah, to when so we so this, this malt is hardly seven and a half gallons. Has everything already in there that that yeast basically already needs. So, how much yeast nutrient would you put in if you were doing like a seven and a half gallon sugar wash? Uh, oh, fifteen grams. We did. We did. We did fifteen grams. Yeah, so you're gonna need at least fifteen grams. Whereas this is uh, maybe like three to five. So you're gonna use three times as much oh. nutrient when you're doing uh, the sugar wash. I see. Okay, so you can see here, we're just kind of watching this line. And it's looking quite a bit clearer now. So it's only been a few minutes. We'll just go ahead and we'll let it run for a couple more minutes and just keep on letting this filter out. And then we're just going to use that counterflow chiller and then go right into our fermenter. Can you explain one more time? I understand the, the water is taking the, the smaller particles that are broken off from the flake and the malt and then recycling it back over the top and okay. filtering it back down. So we're using it kind of as a filter to exactly. catch everything until it's coming out clear. Yep, just to kind of clear it out. So it'll be like pretty hazy because you'll have all that protein and all that, those little grain bits kind of in solution. But we're just going to use that grain bed, let it really solidify and just kind of harden down. Like right now we're not going to want to stir it. We're not going to want to mix up that grain bed bad up. We want it to all kind of just kind of settle down at the bottom and then filter all that protein and all that stuff out of there. And then, you know, as we have it choked a little bit, we're not letting it fly through full speed. Um, so we got it choked at about 45 uh, on this side. And then we're gonna slow it down even more when we're sparking. But right now, we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna collect some of this hot first wort, and we're gonna make a, a, a small, we're gonna rehydrate our yeast. By making a, a slurry from the uh, wort? Yep.
a, a magnetic stir bar in here. So we're just going to go ahead and we're just going to collect some of this. We don't need much, about 800 milliliters. So this is going to take a couple of seconds to get it get right. Whatever yeast that you're using, there's going to be instructions for rehydration and for pitching. So just follow the manufacturer's recommendations. They've done experiments on this. They know uh, what temperature to, to do everything at. So we like to use this distilled max MW. It's a malt whiskey yeast. Um, so just right here on the back, it tells you five minutes. Uh, 96.8 or 36 degrees Celsius. So that's what we're going for. Uh, this that is a temperature probe right here. So we're at, we're at about 34 degrees Celsius. So that's right about where we want to be. So we're just going to go ahead and we use about a gram to a gram and a half uh, uh, yeast per gallon of water. So for our seven and a half gallon batch, we'll, we'll do about 10 grams of yeast. So let's, we'll go ahead and we'll, we'll measure this out. Um, and then you can see that this is open right now. So this is an open container of yeast. So a lot of people have a lot of questions. Can you open yeast and reuse it if it's dry? Um, so yes, you can, but there are some things to consider. Um, when you open your package of yeast, that yeast is going to be exposed to oxygen is the main thing. So what that does is that yeast kind of wakes up a little bit and it, it's going to start making sterols. So that sterol, those sterols are going to help with cell wall function. And, and basically, if you have an open pack of yeast, you're going to have to know, you're going to maybe want to think about limiting your oxygen into your fermenter because you're going to get more yeast growth is the big thing. So if you have an open pack of yeast, a lot of times you get more growth. So it's just a, some factors to consider. When you have more yeast, yeast growth, sometimes it uses those nutrients not just to make alcohol, it uses them to grow. So if you have more yeast growth, you're, um, you might see your alcohol diminish. Um, and that's one factor, but it's usually not that big of a deal if you open it and you can use it fairly quickly. But that is a factor you have to consider. And how do you do that? You just limit the oxygenation in, of your wash or of your wort then too. You gotta refrigerate your yeast. Yep, so keep it refrigerated. Uh, so we just need about 10 grams. You can see here we're almost at 35 degrees Celsius, so that's about exactly where we want to be. And then just about 10 grams of yeast. And so this was all sterilized too. Um, our beakers, our serve uh, rod, and everything. So there's 10 grams. So now we'll just kind of add this to here and then let it spin for about five minutes. And then by the time this is ready, um, we should hopefully have it run, run off. So go ahead and pull our probe out. Let's go ahead and add this. Nice and slow. We're also trying to make sure uh, there's no clumps. So we want to just make sure all this yeast uh, it gets saturated. Okay. So we'll let that go for about five minutes and then we'll go uh, work on our, our sparge and our runoff. Kick on our chiller. So for us, we just had to turn on this water and it's running this counter flow and then it's kind of down that sink. So it's going to drop it down to room temperature. Yeah, so that would water. drop our wash down to room temperature. So it's basically we have hot water, or hot water running the one way, cold water running the other way, and that surface contact will cool that water for us. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and kick this off. 170 degree sparge water over here, so that's perfect. 
So now we'll just start running right into our fermenter. So the goal here is just to leave a nice thin layer of water over the top of your grain bed. So we want to try to match our run out with how much we're putting in. So we'll just go ahead and go nice and slow. Don't rush your sparge. This is where you're going to kill your efficiencies if you go too fast here. Just go nice and slow. So don't rush it. Just kind of let, let gravity feed it and just kind of watch it. Um, so we're not even using the pump yet. So just let gravity kind of feed that through. Now with the chiller, you want to drop it down to about 90 degrees? Uh, no, we're going to aim for about 75. 75? Yep. Oh. So as that's coming out, let's kind of try to get uh, our sparge kind of dialed in. So just our hot liquor tank coming in. So now we're just trying to match this flow as it's coming out. Are you measuring how much hot water you're putting in? Yeah, so basically we'll, we'll use the volume. Basically there's probably a, uh, only about five or six gallons in there right now. So I know we're going to need about almost all of that sparge water. And then we'll measure it on the volume coming in out here too. So we're going a little fast, so we'll just kind of uh, choke this ball valve a little bit. Okay. So you're continuing to put hot water in the top of the sparge to help leach the sugars. Or yes. The no, it's going to just push, help push that uh, wash through, all that first wash through. So we're going to use that hot water to push all of that first work through the bottom and into our fermenter. Okay. And then nice and even. That's why we wanted to maintain that same balance. We only want about a quarter of an inch of water just on top of that green bed. Hmm. It doesn't matter the amount of volume you do or the amount of gallons you do, the process is the same. No, it matters. It, it all matters. Different depending on the process that we're doing today. We're doing Exactly the same. Yeah, this bigger scale. So if you see here, we have our hot liquor tank. Uh -huh. Down below we have our water pump. It goes up and then you see that ring. That's our sparge ring where we, we just rinse that hot, hot water over that grain bed. And then instead of going right to our war pump, we'll actually go to that grant tank first. And then from that grant tank, uh, through to our war pump and then into our fermenter. Or through our chiller and then into our so you can see here, uh, we've only collected about a gallon or so. So we only want to go about like a gallon to a gallon and a half a minute. So real slow going through. So this is where you'll kind of mess it up and this is where you'll kill your efficiencies. Because if you sparge too fast. So if you just open up these valves and you crank this out real quick, you're going to leave a ton of sugar behind. So just nice and slow, you got to have patience. And then you just kind of watch it. So if, if you know you start filling up your your sparge water, you know slow it down coming in, or like you know just kind of have to tweak your ball valves. But you just want to kind of match. Same flow coming out, same flow coming in. Just keep a nice even layer. And what that does is, if you didn't keep it nice and even, you can tunnel holes in your mash bed. So you can just be having hot water go through one little area, and you get a really good extraction on uh, one half. But you want to maintain that nice even balance so you get a nice even extraction on that whole bed. Then you let it dry out. So don't let your grain bed dry out. If you let it dry out, you can tunnel holes in that mash bed. And because that water is going to take the easiest path out of, the, of this grain bed. It's always going to follow the easiest path. So if you tunnel a hole in it, that water is just going to go right through that hole and right out. And you'll get an extraction on a, a little bit of it, but you won't get an extraction on that whole grain bed, which is what we're trying to do. So a thin layer on the top and nice and even pulling right out. And then this right here is where it's most susceptible to being infected. So as soon as that yeast is ready, we'll go ahead and we'll get that right in there. So let's go ahead and we'll, we'll kind of cover that up. And like the only thing, like I won't, don't, you know, get your mash uh, paddle in here. But the only thing I will do is kind of just even it out. So if like you see, 
uh, portion on your mash bed where you got a little bit more grain, it's not quite even, just go ahead and kind of gently just kind of move it over and just make it nice and even. But you're not going to want to stir it, you're not going to want to disrupt that mash bed at all. So just that nice thin layer of water that's on the top. And I can see we're, we're flowing a little slow, so let's go ahead and we'll just increase this coming in. Which is nice and slow and easy. And then we'll, we'll, we're at the same time we're watching um, our yeast starter over there. And once we start seeing some growth and some activity from that yeast, we know it's good and it's growing, it's healthy. Get that in there right away. So as it's filling up, pitch that yeast. Because this is continuing to move over here. The onion is still. It's not going to affect the yeast. Yeah, no, yeah, you, you want to mix it up because that's going to bring in oxygen and it's just going to make sure it's uh, nice and uh, even. And all that, all those uh, yeast, none of them are clumped together and they're all saturated with uh, that solution. So yeah, it's nice and slow. You don't want to go too fast. And you can see here when we first started to what that looks like now. Now it looks like uh, a, a nice layer of water on the top. You want that layer to be nice and clear. Because that means you push all that water through. And I cut off that sparred water. And now we're just going to let the rest of it just flow through. And we're just using gravity, we're not even running that pump anymore. You have to be really quality, really careful with the flow of that sponge so that you don't punch those holes and yeah. it can cause a problem real fast. Yep, so you want to maintain same, and that's why you just want to match what's going out with what's coming in. So if you can just match that flow rate, it makes it you know nice and easy on there. Do you, do you get a hole or something? Can you match it with a paddle or something? Just don't let your grain bed run dry. Just make sure uh, you, you maintain that moisture in the inside of there. Now you're just draining the rest of that now. Yep, so now we're just letting her fill up. So I'm just going to dry out. That you just made a wart for a beer with dump the Exactly. So if you wanted to make beer, you would just take this into your brew kettle, you'd boil it, and you'd add hops. And then same, then you would chill it and then pitch your yeast. So we're just kind of skipping that, that whole step. And that's mainly because we disinfected with that high mash temperature. And then we're using that yeast for that super short leg time and that works at those higher temperatures as well. So this will ferment out very fast. We're gonna have to make sure our temperature is about... Yep, so we want it about 75 degrees because we know we're gonna get that big increase in temperature once that yeast is, is fermenting. So like on that board, you know, we, we started at 73, but we got all the way up to 90. So we saw, you see that big temperature increase, and you want to know where you want to end up, not where you're at. And that small chill plate will drop it down to that temperature. Yep, so we'll take a temperature, a bricks reading, and gravity reading off on this. So we'll test it after we, we're done, and we'll see how we did. So, now let's uh, look at our yeast over here again. Okay, so now we just had to test it and see, see how we did. So, um, we were shooting for seven and a half gallons into the fermenter. Brewer's friend told us it was going to be 10.55. Um, that's kind of what we're judging, how, how, how good did we do. So one thing I, I noticed from this, that bucket is really full. I think we have eight gallons in there and not seven and a half. So what we notice is our gravity is a little lighter. So it, it's at right at 1050. So we undershot it by about five points from what we expected, but we have probably at least another half gallon in, in that fermenter. So 
I'm not worried that we did a bad conversion. I'm not worried that that sugar is not there. We just got a little bit more volume. So no worries when during distillation, we'll be able to pull that back and, and re, re get it uh, dialed in. But super good, so 1050, I'm super happy with that. You can notice how clear that wash is too. Mm -hmm. Not a single piece of grain in, in there whatsoever. So how do you know we got a good conversion on there? We can go ahead and we can test this with iodine. So iodine will react with starch. Um, it will not react with the fermentable sugar. So we just need to take a small sample of this and, and drop some iodine in it. Uh, nothing special, just some normal iodine tincture that you can buy in any, any type of pharmacy. And then you just need a couple drops. So, you see how that's orange or kind of yellow? Mm -hmm. yeah. So when it reacts with starch, it will turn black or purple or very dark color. Whereas, see, this is orange or kind of yellowish. So that's telling me we got a really good conversion. There's not very much starch left in that solution. Mm -hmm. And it's an instant retest. As soon as you dump that iodine in there, you read it instantly. So. That is all basically fermentable sugar. We got a really good conversion there. No worries. So now what I like to do is let's just go ahead and taste it. Let's see how it tastes. So this is all natural. This is 100% malted barley, 25% peated, 75% uh, two-row. So what you want to the kind of purpose here of tasting is after we do this distillation, we want to be able to retain the flavor of this grain and that smoke and the sweetness of that barley and the kind of those honey notes all the way through. Do you all in? No. no. <laughs> so let's go ahead and taste it. You really get that smoke from that pea. But then on, on the end of it, it just has all that sweetness. It's kind of biscuity. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of. Uh, Got a lot of like grain cereal kind of notes to it. Very delicate. Very yeah, delicate. Very and it's not over the top either. But you're gonna have to remember those those that concentration of that smoke is just gonna come out through distillation. So the more we distill that product, that that's just gonna intensify. It's gonna concentrate all all those flavors when we do that run. Interesting. Um, so that tastes awesome. Yeah. So this is I think is about ready. We see we got some nice CO two bubbles forming on along the outside of that. So let's just go ahead and we'll get our yeast pitched and, and we're, we're basically done. So we'll just take this, and this is our, our yeast slurry, and we'll just go ahead and we'll add this right to our fermenter. Sir? I don't even need to do anything. No, sir. It's all good. You just don't want to infect anything in there, so just go ahead and we'll just get this locked up tight. Get an air bung on here, and then, and then we're done. This will be a, a three to four day fermentation? Yep, in about three to four days, this will be complete, and then we, we'll go ahead and we'll just get that right into the still. Now when you run that in the still, would, would you run all six plates in it, or what percentage of alcohol would you run? Out of? No, so what I would do is I would take out every other plate, and maybe only run about three plates on that still. And about what, what proof or percentage would you want coming out of the still for this for this particular single malt? So we'll we'll end up about sixty to seventy proof is what you, what you're gonna want to shoot for coming out. When you do that, are you gonna rerun it again? Yeah, that will just be your, your stripping run, and then you'll reprocess that in, into your spirit run. And then on your spirit run, what would you what would you run that at? Just like the final spirit. We, at the end, we ideally we like to be to 100 and 110 proof, and then we would just basically would, would like to age that from there. Okay. Yeah, so that's basically it. We can just kind of test. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Yeah, thanks for watching.